I do have to comment, uh, Mr. Mills, your last statement there, or included as part of your last statement, uh, the, the recognition or the reality that we are switching our vulnerability, if you will, from liquid state to soon solid state. That's something that I think we need to be thinking about. And it's, it's something that this committee has focused on. Uh, Senator Manchin and I had our critical minerals bill that we included in the Energy Act. Uh, but we know we need to be doing more with that regard. And uh, what you have highlighted here, I think, is very important. And, and you, Dr. Birol, in your comments, um, mentioned much the same. And again, I want, to, I want to extend my thanks and my appreciation to Dr. Barol, you and your leadership, uh, the opportunity that I have had to serve as a member of the Global Commission on Energy Efficiency, um, some of the best practices that, that we have been able to, to work through and talk about. I just so appreciate your, your leadership there. Uh, I, I guess I would direct this question to, to both Dr. Birol and, and you, Mr. Mills. We have seen uh, recent executive actions. Um, Senator Barrasso mentioned them earlier when we uh, were taking up the, the confirmation of Jennifer Granholm for Secretary of Energy. But these actions um, uh, potentially jeopardize the, the very future uh, development and production of U.S. fossil fuel resources. Um, so we know U.S. LNG markets, our exports are particularly yeah. important for markets in Asia. So the question to you both is, if future U.S. oil and gas exports are no longer available within the broader global market, um, this reduction in, in supply is going to be met elsewhere. Um, and so to, to you, perhaps, Dr. Barol, what, what countries benefit the most from U.S. oil and gas exports, and where will future supplies then come from if, if the U.S. cuts its exports? And then uh, following that, uh, Mr. Mills, if you can speak to what a reduction in, in U.S. oil and gas production really means for the development of, of the global markets. I appreciate your views on this. Dr. Birol? Much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Senator Markowski, uh, once again, and thank you very much for your leadership uh, in addressing one of the critical issues uh, of uh, clean energy, namely energy efficiency, best practices for households, for industry, for transportation sector, with other leaders uh, around the world. Now, if the uh, United States production uh, is set to decline, the, uh, and if there is a still strong demand for oil around the world, the, uh, the gap will be met mainly by the uh, cheap cost uh, Middle East uh, countries. Having said that, when we look at the uh, current oil uh, demand numbers, as a result of COVID, they went down substantially. And we do not expect that the uh, demand will go there where it was before the COVID in next three or four years to come. This is uh, on that uh, issue. And uh, there is a huge amount of spare capacity in the markets now, which uh, the markets can uh, make use of. In terms of LNG, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, the flexible nature of U.S. LNG contributed uh, a lot uh, around the world and br brought the price of uh, gas uh, down uh, since uh, last few years. And uh, interestingly enough, the main purchaser of U.S. LNG today is by far is uh, China. From an emissions point of view, U.S. LNG, if it replaces coal in Asia, it can lead to significant emission declines, both in terms of CO2 emissions, but also for air pollution. Having said that, uh, the methane emissions are very important here, and it is very important that the 
to note that several customers around the world will soon look at the methane footprint of the, uh, their gas exporters, and therefore perhaps an important task for the uh, uh, current administration to take note of. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. Mills. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. The, um, I would say first that the IEA has been remarkably honest, uh, and I don't mean this as a, an any surprise or shock, at outlining the realities of where the world's energy markets are, are going in the near term, both with respect to the demand for critical energy minerals, but also with respect to where oil and gas demand are, are trending given the nature of the world. So it's my, my go-to uh, for, we'll call it honest uh, analyses at the global level. Your, your question about what will happen to the U.S. and world development is, I think, a particularly appropriate one. Is, is, uh, as we know, the demand for oil is not, and in all the forecasts show, it's not going to uh, decline. It's going to go back up to roughly where it was. Who produces that oil uh, and who's going to produce the natural gas? We, we know, I would add to the OPEC nations, Russia uh, is the other uh, principal beneficiary and some other African nations, but principally it's Russia and OPEC. The, the world divides simplistically into oil and gas, transportation and electric power, roughly speaking. And the United States role in the transportation markets and the cost for people to get around in cars, we can distill it, our impact in a very simple way. We, we in America were essentially responsible for the collapse of world oil prices to the benefit of world consumers who drive and fly. There will be about a billion cars added to the world's roads over the coming couple decades. Even if all the existing cars become electric, which is going to be extraordinarily difficult, there will still be an enormous demand for oil. Markets, consumers will want that oil to be cheap. We drove the price down. We can continue to drive the price down. It's essentially the swing producer. That's what's happened. The United States became, in the last decade, to the total shock of the world, the swing producer. It's to the detriment of US oil companies, by the way, because it means you're a price taker. You're not a market maker. You're, every time prices go up, as we all know, it's like Mardi Gras again in the oil fields, and they start drilling, and prices get a collapse. Natural gas is the go-to uh, source of electricity uh, for the world. Not, coal is still growing, as you all know, but natural gas is the go-to. And there, as well, the US shale fields directly cause the collapse in global gas prices, just the, just the anticipation of the U.S. entering global markets caused prices to collapse. Gazprom, again, negotiating and renegotiating new prices with, with Europe. The world benefited. The world's electric consumers benefited from American shale fields. Lastly, I'll, I'll note in terms of development, the United States, and I, this sounds a, a little bit bombastic, because, but I'm a Canadian as well as an American. The American oil and gas industry is the technologically most sophisticated in the world. It's, path-breaking capabilities, not just to produce marginal oil and gas more inexpensively, but more efficiently, which in the fuel cycle for carbon dioxide emissions matters, and more environmentally sensibly. So we are the pioneers in that. If we push that oil production and gas production to parts of the world which are not as cautious and not as good at it as us, the oil and gas will be produced there. It will be less efficient, less clean, and probably more expensive, which I think net bad for the world. Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Brasso. I think both gentlemen have, have uh, well pushed me beyond my time, but I think their responses and the reality of the role that the United States has played in a very dramatic way, very quickly, in terms of being that player um, in, in production, in what we have been able to, to do uh, with, our, with our allies, is nothing short of extraordinary, and I would certainly hate to see us go backwards with that very significant and dominant role. Thank you.